one of those who lived and died on what in Australia is known as the Death Railway. A vast pharaonic project, this 428 kilometre railway was built through wild jungle in what was then Siam and is today Thailand in less than a year in 1943 by a quarter of a million slave labourers working mostly naked with almost no machinery and only the most basic of hand tools. Between 100,000 and 200,000 men died. More corpses than there are words in my novel. My father was a survivor of that, of cholera, of the hell ships that then took the POWs to Japan, <coughs> of being a slave labourer in a coal mine under the inland sea south of Hiroshima at war's end. If Basho's narrow road to the deep north is one of the high points of Japanese culture, my father and his mate's experience is one of its lowest. For 12 years I tried to write a novel about that experience and all that suggested to me. And for 12 years other, novel, other novels came and went as I continued to be unable to write this one. I wrote five wildly different versions of this novel, all of them failures, all of which I deleted and burnt. And then I realised my father, now in his 90s, was growing frail and weak, and I had to somehow finish this novel before he died. For a year I visited him and called with endless questions about daily life in the camp. What came first, the roll call or the breakfast? How does a rotting shin bone smell when revealed by a blossoming tropical ulcer. What was it like to have cholera? I understood, though it made no sense, that this was the book I had to write if I was to keep on writing. And slowly, a new final form of the novel began to take shape. My memories of my father when I was a child are of a sick man debilitated by his war experience. Myself and my five brothers and sisters grew up with a man of often strange anxieties and deep compassion, whose stories of his POW experiences were often very funny, but compounded of love and pity. But I did not want this book to be about him as much as his experience and perspective came to influence it, I did not want some fictionalised version of his life. As much as it was about my father and me, it had to escape us both. I went to Thailand and walked up and back and found the site of my father's camp, walked that bitter track through the jungle from that camp to what little remains of the railway and the dead overgrown embankments and cuttings. And I realised that this novel had to be a love story. Because great love stories seek to demonstrate the great truth about love, that we discover eternity in a moment that dies immediately after. War stories inevitably deal in death. While love if it does not redeem war, still remains the greatest expression of hope without which any story rings untrue to life. And I had been long taken by a story that my parents were fond of. A Latvian man they knew, a post-war refugee, caught up in those vast movements of lives that the Second World War had involved in Eastern Europe had returned to his home village after the war to find it razed to the ground and his wife, he was told, dead. He refused to believe it. He searched the wastelands of post-war Europe, that strange apocalyptic hell, for two years looking for her. But finally he had to accept the truth that she had perished. He immigrated to Australia moved to the village where I was born, met an Australian woman, married and had children. 
1957, he went to the mainland and visited Sydney. And walking down a crowded street, he saw walking toward him his Latvian wife, alive, with a child on either hand. At that moment, he had to decide whether he would acknowledge her or walk on. This story had always struck me as the most beautiful I knew about love. And I started my novel again with this image at its heart. It was a love story and its leading figure, a character utterly unlike my father, a doctor who was the commander of the prisoners of war in one camp and who after the war finds to his disgust that he's celebrated as a war hero. My father worried that people would forget all that had happened and he trusted that I might write something that encouraged people to remember. Yet if my father was very helpful with my endless questioning of minute detail, he never asked me what the story was. He allowed me the very necessary thing a writer must have, the freedom to write as they had to write. Yet I felt rather shamefully that perhaps I wouldn't be able to finish it until he died, as though there was something in all this that held me back. Towards the end of 2012, the novel now taking its final form, I resolved to do what I had for so long put off, and that was to visit Japan. There I searched and found several guards who had worked on the death railway. I met a man who had been a Japanese army medical orderly who had actually been at my father's camp. It looked, he said, like a Buddhist hell. He recalled skeletons crawling around in the mud. The Australians were very bad with their hygiene, he told me. The Japanese took hot baths. The Australians didn't. I paid for his tea and taxi home. And the next day I was to meet another guard in, uh, in a taxi office in an outer suburb of Tokyo. Five minutes before I arrived, I realised he was the one who had been the Ivan the Terrible of my father's camp, the man the Australians knew as the Lizard. The Lizard had been sentenced to death for war crimes after the war. Later he had his death sentence commuted to life imprisonment and then was released in a general amnesty in 1956. He is the only man I ever heard my father, a gentle, peaceful man, talk of with violent intent. Lee Hack Ray, as he is now known, was a dignified, gentle and generous old man. Near the end of our meeting, after talking for perhaps an hour and a half, I asked him to slap me. Violent face slapping, known as binta, was the immediate form of punishment in the camps, doled out frequently, viciously and continuously. It was a curious request and the old man took some persuasion. Finally, we stood up facing each other and I asked him to slap me as hard as he could. Of his slaps, I recall only how clean and dry the skin of his aged hand was as it struck me. On the third blow, in one of those coincidences in which reality delights but fiction, for fear of being unrealistic, is not permitted, the taxi office began to shake and toss violently like a dinghy in a wild sea. A 7.3 Richter scale earthquake had hit Tokyo and for half a minute I saw the lizard frightened and I saw too that wherever evil is it wasn't in that room with that frightened old man and me. I went south to where my father was a slave labourer and the mayor of San Juanada City met me in front of TV cameras to apologise. I met villagers who remembered those Australians arriving in that terrible winter of late 1944 
skeletons, they said, in shorts. I met more guards. I was photographed by local media with one guard, Mr Sato, at the site of the camp where my father thought he would die in the spring of 1945. Below us, where once stood the mine head, the POWs, would run a gauntlet of sadistic guards to enter, there now stood, of all things, a love hotel. It was a bitterly cold day. We were asked to put our arms around each other for a photograph. A tiny, frail man of 94, Mr Sato curled into me in the manner children do when seeking forgiveness. And when I took my arm away, he continued to curl into me. That night I ended up drinking in a Japanese hostess bar with Kenji Yasuhagi, the Sanyuanada City Council's International